questions to the Minister of Education. And we'll start with listed questions. Can I advise members that questions number one and five have been withdrawn? And I call Mr. Alistair Ross. Number two, please. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. I am currently considering the merits and feasibility of making a further major capital announcement before the end of the current mandate. For projects to proceed in planning for the primary sector, the school managing authorities were asked to submit a limited number of priority proposals for consideration. Due to the demands in the Department of Education's capital budget, all projects that are prioritised by managing authorities for investment are considered by my department against a protocol to determine the projects that should proceed in planning at that time. A similar protocol developed for the last major capital announcement in June 2014 will be used to gateway score the projects and ultimately produce a prioritised list for those for announcement. I call Alistair Ross for supplementary. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I, I, I listened to the Minister saying he was considering whether to make an announcement before the end of the mandate. Given that this Minister has already announced that he won't be the Education Minister post-May and perhaps even a different uh, party will, will occupy that post, can I ask him whether any announcement that would be made before the end of the mandate uh, would hold through after the election, or whether those schools, such as Ida McGee and my own constituency, who have been waiting patiently for over a decade for a, a new build, uh, would have any confidence that such an announcement before the end of the mandate would be followed through after May? Well, uh, I understand why the member would ask such a question, but if you follow that through to its logic, then no minister should make any announcement uh, from this point onwards, uh, because no one knows who is going to be in a ministry following uh, the May elections, which party will hold the ministry or which personalities will hold the ministry. What I am trying to ensure here is that we have a rolling programme of school development and, and builds moving forward into years ahead. And what have, has become obvious uh, from my time within the Department of Education is that you need to pre-plan these things a couple of years in advance. So certainly any new minister come in will be perfectly entitled to review a capital announcement. But I would caution anyone who is in the post by saying that uh, if you wish to continue the investment in schools, if you wish to continue the investment in the economy and the construction industry, then you have to allow these programmes of work to develop, and it will take maybe 18 months to two years to deliver some of these projects. I call Dolores Kelly. Thank you, uh, Deputy Speaker. Uh, can I ask the Minister in particular uh, about St Ronan's College in Lurgan? He, he will, as a fellow constituency representative, know of the particular difficulties over a three-split campus. And if you could also give me an update on this more comprehensive school new build. Uh, both the, the new build for St Ronan's and the new build for Lismore are moving along as planned, business cases, etc., proceeding. And the schools are involved in detailed discussions with the relevant authorities around developing those building programmes. Uh, as you know, the Lismore School is going to move on to the site behind where it currently is. St Ronan's is going to be built on what was known as the St Michael's site, though there will decant previous to that build onto what's now the St Paul's site, and that's expected to take place. Uh, the decant is expected to take place. It could take place uh, in December of this year. But I think the school are, don't want to decant mid-term, so it maybe we will wait until uh, the September 17 decant, our, our period to decant them on the St Paul site. But both of those schools are proceeding as planned. I call Joanne Dobson. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Um, does the Minister not recognise the frustra frustration in the community when announcements about new capital projects are made, but years actually pass without nothing happening on the ground? So can I ask the Minister what does he believe is the root cause of this? Well, uh, if you're spending significant amounts of public monies, the reality is that you have to go through uh, a, quite a lengthy list of procurement, business cases, site identification, etc., before you can actually lay one brick on top of the other. And I understand it's frustrating. And one of the reasons why I, as Minister, have, not, have made the decision to make limited announcements at each stage is to ensure that we can progress bills uh, to a point where they, they are going on site within a reasonable period of time, and that we don't make uh, announcements of the previous direct rule minister, for instance, uh, made an announcement of over 110 new school bills. They had the money to build them. And there was no possibility of many of those schools being built within a 10-year time frame. So yes, I do understand the frustration, but I do believe now that my department has put in place measures which ensures that schools do go on site within a timely fashion. I call Chris Little. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Can I uh, welcome the £4 million investment in Strandtown Primary School in East Belfast as part of the school enhancement programme delivered by the Minister and ask him 
uh, what benefits he thinks that will bring to the over 1,000 pupils at the school. Uh, th this is one of the areas where I think uh, the Department of Education has been innovative on delivering uh, radical change to the schools of state by de developing the school enhancement programme. I have been delighted over this last number of months to visit numerous schools who have had up to £4 million spent on their schools of state, and it has revitalised and refurbished the school of state uh, and ensured that it is fit for purpose going into the future. And Strand Town will be no different. This investment in Strand Town will provide the much needed facilities for that school. It marries in with the recent development proposal uh, I approve for the school. I am sure that the school is fit for purpose uh, going into the future in terms of its facilities. I call Alex Upwood. Uh, question number three, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, with your permission, I will answer questions three, nine, and ten together, and would request an additional minute, which I think is in order. Uh, it was a teachers' union who brought this idea to, to me in 2012. At the time, I did not have the funding to develop this proposal further or to implement it. Most recently, I secured agreement from the executive for the Public Sector Transformation Fund to be used for this scheme. The $33 million was secured on the basis that the overall aim of the scheme is to refresh the teaching workforce through release of teachers aged 55 plus and recruit recently qualified teachers. While this scheme is not about saving money, in line with all schemes funded by the Public Sector Transformation Fund, the funding was secured on the basis that the scheme would re release cost savings. This scheme would provide up to additional 500 teaching job opportunities, which would not otherwise exist. In addition to these new jobs, in the last five years there have been in the region of 500 permanent teaching posts and in excess of 250 meaningful temporary teaching posts, which are jobs six months or over, coming onto the job market annually. However, for these 750 job opportunities, teachers with least experience, that is the most recently qualified, have often been sifted out before interview effectively, eliminating them from these opportunities. And I ask, where is the equality for them and who speaks for them? I have been challenged to open up the scheme to any teacher without a permanent post. If that is what some members want me to do, then I take a proposal to the executive. But you need to understand that by doing this, the scheme will not refresh the teaching workforce, not provide job opportunities for those who experience the greatest difficulty in securing meaningful employment, and not save any money. In fact, it will cost the public purse an additional substantial amount of money on top of the $33 million already secured to fund the scheme. If I am able to secure the agreement from the executive, and it is a big if, then I can assure the House that this scheme will not run again, it will be a one-off. Because to do it means the executive will have to cut other services, or the scheme can run as intended, with the job opportunities open to those teachers who have qualified most recently. This year, the scheme would run as a pilot, with every chance of being successful. Then it could run again, given the Public Sector Transformation Fund is available for the next years, if the scheme runs as currently outlined. However, if members of the House are lobbying uh, quite actively, some of them, for the scheme to be opened up to everyone, then I will have to bring a paper to the executive to seek agreement to fund it in that manner. I call Alex uh, uh, thank you, and could I thank the Minister uh, for his answer. He will understand the despair that exists uh, among so many teachers who have been qualified for three years and more that they are not going to have access to the 500 teaching opportunities that the Minister referred to. I think there is a model that could be developed that could be more inclusive. But independent of that, have you sought legal advice? Are you prepared to share that legal advice with the Assembly, or at least share with the Assembly the broad contents of that legal advice in terms of equality and human rights implications? Uh, yes, I have received legal advice, and like every other minister, I will not be sharing my legal advice with anyone else because it is confidential and relates to. Uh, the member still asking the question. I'm not sure. Shall I sit down again to let you finish? Uh, the, 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 will not be sharing my legal advice with anyone else because it is confidential. No, I am confident that the legal advice backs up the case for change which I have outlined. The member and, and many others keep referring to a three-year time limit on this. That is a proposal. I have constantly said from day one, though there are some who have chosen not to listen, and there are others who have used this scheme or the proposals around this scheme to advance their own political careers. 
uh, and the members' party is very guilty of this. I have to say they have given they have given misinformation to concerned teachers. They have given them misdirection. They have given them uh, information which is false, wrong, and is leading them down the garden path. I have also received advice from the Equality Commission, and I am satisfied that our discussions with the Equality Commission uh, are fruitful, that we will continue to discuss with them. And when a final proposal is agreed by me, it will be presented to the Equality Commission for their views. So all those discussions are ongoing. But the, ma the member says to me he is confident that another scheme, an inclusive scheme, can be developed. I can develop a scheme which will allow all teachers to apply, but it is going to cost the executive money. And since I got agreement from the executive in the first place to fund this scheme up to £33 million, I am going to have to bring a paper back to the executive and ask the executive, are they prepared to fund the scheme which will have all teachers applying to it? And then the members' concerns about equality. What about those teachers who are at most disadvantaged? Those who have qualified in this last three, four, five, six years? Where, who's speaking for them? Where is their equality? Who is speaking up for their job opportunities? Because the member has chosen one side of an argument, of a very, very complex The Minister's argument. two minutes is up. Um, could I encourage everyone to, to address the Chair and, and to, in order to ensure that uh, Hansford is able to pick everything up? And I call Adrian McQuillan. Thank you. Uh, can I thank the Minister for his answer so far? Minister, can you put a time scale on when this can be rolled out? And if you have reconsideration of the, the years that the, the to teachers that are, are finished in the colleges uh, can apply for it as well. Um, I am actively considering the option of extending the scheme, as I said from day one. Uh, the initial announcement was around those who had qualified in the last three years will be able to qualify. But I have always said I am looking at the broader parameters of the scheme, and we are seeing in terms of, both in terms of the implications for those teachers who have qualified in the last four, five, six years in terms of how they are able to access employment, because those who cry equality want to ensure that those who are most disadvantaged, those who have qualified recently, are given an opportunity to apply for meaningful posts. And I am also looking at the cost implications of that. But uh, uh, it, this is going to take a number of weeks. There is a, a, some within the Chamber, some without the, outside the Chamber, who are calling for the scheme to be opened up to everyone. If it is to be opened up to everyone, I'm going to have to bring a paper to the executive, and that in itself will add to the time frame as well. I call Sandra Overend. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Uh, Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for, for the response. Indeed, it'll be interest, I would be interested to hear um, about the discussions uh, with the Equality Commission um, that the Minister says is ongoing. Um, I wonder, as the Minister one suggestion that has come to me recently is, is for those, those teachers who are outside the three year limit, uh, if they were willing to take a pay, um, a pay reduction so that they would be along the same lines as those who are new, newly qualified within the three year status, um, if that would be something that the Minister would uh, take into consideration and then it would qualify for the limited funds that the Minister is allocating uh, to, this, to this scheme. Um, but furthermore, does the Minister recognise uh, that the fundamental problem that there are too many teachers uh, being Question, trained? Please. Uh, probably that's a couple of questions there. If the, if the members speak, are entitled the, to one question, please the chair complete. Would... Members are invited to ask a question. Please complete. <laughs> Ed, why does the minister insist on topping up the amount of places uh, for, for teacher training at a time when we're critically short of nurses and engineers? Um, I am um, uh, well. I'll take those questions in reverse order. We have reduced the number of teacher training places over this last number of years. And I've said in the House before, the more we reduce our teacher training places, the more students who leave these shores and go to England or Wales or Scotland or, or, or across the border for teacher training. And then many of those come back to here seeking employment. So the more we reduce our teacher training numbers, the more they leave. And we are now in the position where if the member is suggesting we reduce them further, what she's actually saying is we close our teacher training colleges. I do not think that's a sensible proposal. Uh, in relation to reducing the wages or the salary of all teachers down to the start of the pay grade or, or the main pay scale or maybe halfway up the pay scale, I think you're opening up like a Pandora's box there in terms of public sector pay, and I don't wish to open it, because I believe once we start breaking 
uh, are breaching agreements around pay uh, with, with public sector workers, or in this case teachers, then where does it end? Do we do what has been happened uh, in the South, where they are bringing in teachers, newly qualified teachers, and paying them a completely different pay scale than those who qualified one or two years previously? I am not prepared to go down that road. I know uh, the SDLP were down canvassing in the South for a party which does do that. Uh, but I am not prepared to go down that road. I am not prepared to mess about with public sector pay agreements. I call Peter Weir. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. It is good to see we are ending on a spirit of bonhomie. I will try not to give in the Minister <coughs> a multiple choice answer. The Minister indicated that the initial proposals came from the teaching unions. I wonder if the Minister could outline what discussions he has had with the teaching unions since the announcement of the scheme to try and find a way through this uh, to provide a, a reasonably satisfactory answer in terms of a final scheme. We have established a working group between the employers and the, 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 the Teaching Council, uh, and there are discussions ongoing around that table around the scheme. I have had uh, discussions with the trade unions, both in terms of a formal setting, around a range of other issues they have been presenting with me, and we touched on this. And indeed, I am presenting myself to the teacher uh, unions' conferences. Uh, there was one on Friday, and one of the members spoke at it on Saturday. Uh, and there is a range of those over the next number of weeks, and I am measuring opinion from them as well. And I think the member will reflect that there is a mixed opinion uh, coming back from uh, the membership, certainly, on how the scheme should proceed. So I am uh, listening to what the informed views of people in regards to this matter. I am separating uh, some of the more ill-informed commentary that comes across at times, and I am looking at options available to me and to the executive, because I keep coming back to this point. The executive set aside £33 million uh, of the Public Sector Transformation Fund to fund this scheme. I cannot deviate from that unless I get agreement from the executive, and to deviate from it in the means for which some are calling for will mean that actually it's going to cost the executive a significant amount of money over a number of years. And if we go down that road and the executive agreed it, so be it. But I do think we're losing an opportunity in relation to this scheme, not only this year, but next year and the following year, where you could allow up to 1,500 teachers to retire early and up to 1,500 uh, positions to be filled. But uh, as I say, I'm listening, and the final proposals uh, will be published as soon as possible. I call Raymond McCartney. I will ask on Coyle Orgas going away against Lesson Eric on the Frag region. Uh, thank you very much, Deputy Speaker, and can I thank the Minister for his answers. In his earlier answer, the Minister talked about the disadvantage that newly qualified teachers have in bringing about this scheme. Would the Minister agree this is something like social clauses where we insist in capital build that there is advantage built in to ensure the long term unemployed get good proper advancement as well? Well, well the member makes a very good point because uh, there's those who they tell me that I'm, I'm, I'm breaking equality legislation, or I'm breaking the law, or I'm actively involved in discrimination, even though, on a daily basis, government departments are involved in discrimination. But you have to have a justifiable reason to be involved in that discrimination. It has to have a broader positive outcome uh, for society or the project you're involved in. And I, I find it difficult, I have to say, when people argue for equality, when they ignore those teachers who have qualified in this last up to six years, who find it the most difficult to find employment, that when we introduce a scheme for it, that there is only one side of the argument heard or broadcast or shouted through the most. I am involved here, as you have said, in a programme of work which is trying to give advantage to those most disadvantaged in finding full-time employment. That is the core of this scheme. Uh, and I will work my way through it, but the member makes a very good point. The executive does this in other, in other areas of work. We put stipulations on multi-million pound contracts going out there to ensure that we give those at most disadvantage an opportunity in the workplace. So I find it difficult for the people to support that and then have some sort of moral objections to this. I call Rosie McCorley. Question four, please. Since May 2011, my department has provided a range of support and investment to encourage and facilitate the development of Irish medium education. I have responded to the growing demand and approved the establishment of three nursery units, four new primary schools and a new post-primary school. The sector has been supported by a major programme of infrastructure development. Over £28 million of investment has been made or planned for major capital works projects and a £2 million accommodation fund provided to tackle poor accommodation in the developing schools. 
I have ensured that key policies have been adjusted to meet the needs of the sector, for example, in transport. We have provided the express services from Downpatrick, Mahara, Crumlin to College of First Year. Key examples of specific support and investment provided by the Department include reform to the common funding formula, bespoke government, governor training, additional annual funding to SEA to develop high quality learning materials, funding to establish an Irish medium leadership development group. The results are clear today. Today, over 5,000 children are benefiting from Irish medium education. It is the fastest growing sector. Uh, further inspection evidence clearly demonstrates that successful Irish medium schools and units are providing high quality teaching and learning in schools closely connected to their community. I call Rosie McCorley for supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answer. And can I take this opportunity to acknowledge that this is the Minister's final question time, so I commend him on, on his performance in this mandate. August um, and Deglom Ear are in Ira, and Deglesh Kershi Sienu are Fasten Yarnal Gil Idricus, August Arnoi, Martasia Gullerai Salatan Yuan. The Minister outlined a uh, a number of developmental uh, projects and, and to do with the growth of the Irish medium sector. And I would just wonder, would he like to comment further on that growth and the, the, that continuing growth in, indeed uh, as it goes on today? Um, well, I think in terms of the growth in the Irish medium sector, we've seen a sector which was largely driven by uh, a very dedicated uh, community voice in terms of those Gale goers who were dedicated to the promotion of the Irish language and the promotion of education through the Irish medium. We have now seen that turn into the delivery of high-quality high Irish medium education, where parents outside that Gilgore movement are now being attracted to having their children educated through the medium of Irish. We see it as not only in terms of uh, the language, but also in terms of the high-quality education that is provided through it, and also the fact that they are learning through the medium of Irish equips a child to pick up other languages as well. So all those positives uh, are attracting parents to, the, to this sector. I commend the professionalism uh, of, of, our, of our principals, our board of governors, our teachers, our, our classroom assistants, and all of that. But I think, and I've said this as well about the integrated sector, for it to continue to succeed, it has to hold on to its community roots. I call Alistair Patterson. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And I note with interest the Minister's comments thus far. Does the Minister also recognise that sustainability and affordability are duties that the Minister must also take into consideration, that when making decisions on Irish medium against official advice and against the recommendations of his own ministerial advisory group, as in the case of Dungiven, and which will possibly be the case if going, if going ahead with the listening ski project? Many people will come to the conclusion that he has made decisions on political and not evidence-based grounds. Um, I thank the member for, for his question. And the, the member may become as a surprise to the member, but I am a politician. Uh, I, I'm not the, anything else other than a politician. And you'll find that m ministers, by their very nature, are politicians, and we make political decisions. Uh, every minister in this chamber does likewise, and as they should. We shouldn't be ashamed. Uh, of, of practising politics. Uh, it has many positives and many benefits for our society. In regards to his commentary around my investment and, and decisions I make, um, well, it gives me an opportunity, uh, as my last question time, to thank the officials from the Department of Education for their sterling work over this last five years. I think our society uh, is, is much the better for the quality and calibre of officials we have in the Department of Education. But every one of them know that when they offer me advice, I as Minister will be the person who makes the decision. And sometimes that decision will be in agreement with their advice, and at other times that will be in disagreement with their advice. And, and they all perfectly understand that. I stand by each of my decisions in relation to Irish medium education. I stand by it on the basis of it being the right and proper thing to do in terms of the development of Irish medium education. I take into account every decision I make in terms of uh, the costs related to that. Uh, I take into account all the, the, the issues which the member has raised before I make a decision, but I believe that the decisions I have made to date were the right and proper decisions, and uh, I have no doubt that the Irish medium sector will continue to go from strength to strength. I call Trevor Lum. 
Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, speaking as one who doesn't have a difficulty with the ministerial duty to facilitate and encourage the Irish medium sector or the integrated sector, but could I ask the minister to comment on the fact that, in respect of the shared education movement, he has an additional duty to promote as well as facilitate and encourage, and does he think that that's equitable? Gormay Agat. <laughs> Go on, Greg. It's less than Valerie Kaist. Uh, well, there's clearly, there's clearly a different in emphasis uh, within the legislation, and I know the member has made attempts during the journey of the shared education bill to certainly uh, bring equality in terms of the integrated sector. Uh, but I think if we're going to change the legislation across the board, we have to change it for both the integrated and the Irish medium sector. Uh, the tr we will find out as time progresses as to whether this term promote is to the advantage of the shared education centre, which means this doesn't automatically mean it's to the disadvantage of the integrated sector, the Irish medium sector, or if it, or if it has little or no impact. Only time will tell that. But uh, I'm sure uh, the next legislative opportunity the member has, he will be raising this matter again. Question number five has been withdrawn. I call Stephen Agnew. Number six. The Fry Start Agreement makes provision for up to 50 million of capital funding for your uh, for each year for the next 10 years for a programme of investment in shared and integrated education projects. I welcome this funding to help provide new and upgraded accommodation for the schools and the integrated sector and to help incentivise good quality shared campuses uh, moving forward. Discussions are progressing well with the NIO, Treasury and the Department of Finance and Personnel to determine the parameters within which this additional funding can be utilised. However, I am not yet in a position to be able to announce how this funding will be allocated. I call Stephen Agnew for supplementary. Uh, thank the Minister for his answer. The Minister will be aware of the situation of Priory Integrated College, whereby uh, its proposal for a new build is locked in um, with a, a, a restructuring of the school estate in, in Hollywood. Um, can the min Minister give me any guidance as to whether or not, should Priory, for example, be eligible for funding through a fresh start, can there be um, a, a tied in with, with other uh, infrastructure funding to ensure that the whole scheme is completed and that Priory doesn't lose out because it's tied in with other uh, Hollywood schools? Um, well, I think certainly the, the new funding under the Fresh Start Agreement gives us an advantage in relation to situations such as Priory. And if you were planning going forward and, and using some of the, the Fresh Start Agreement, for instance, around Priory, then you would plan in such a way that you're using uh, other monies or other funds to open up the other building programmes that are needed uh, in around that area to ensure that Priory can move ahead. So uh, I think, you know, while I can't be definitive in terms of announcements today, I, I never thought I would use the, the sentence, discussions are progressing well with the NAO, the Treasury and the Department of Finance and Personnel. Like, there are three diverse groups uh, who don't always, and I don't always agree with any of them, but I have to say the discussions over the last period of time have been very, very good, very progressive, and it's clear to me that uh, all partners around the table want to ensure that this money is delivered and projects are delivered on the ground. So I think if the member has just been a bit patient on this matter, he may have some good news in the weeks ahead. I call Bronwyn McGowan. Seven. Since coming to office, I have been determined to take action to break the link between social disadvantage and educational underachievement. Through the weighing of school funding and through targeted programmes such as extended schools, the full service programme and nurture units, I have provided additional resources to schools serving the most at risk of underachieving. Funded programmes have been implemented to improve literacy and numeracy outcomes. These include the delivering social change, literacy and numeracy signature programmes, the special educational needs literacy project, uh, strategic development. Uh, fund to area learning communities. I have also provided funding to support programmes aimed at improving school community links. Uh, in addition, the education work programmes I launched in 2012 highlights the vital role parents can play in helping their child do well at school and improve their life chances. Other programmes to address educational underachievement include a revised SEN and inclusion framework, the full implementation of the entitlement framework, Sure Start, and the Early Years Fund. Since 2011, over £220 million has been invested in supporting programmes and initiatives aimed at addressing educational underachievement. In addition to both 14, 15 and 15, 16, they provided an additional £10 million to school funding to support schools with high proportions of pupils 
identified as being socially disadvantaged. And that is the end of our period of time for listed questions, and we now move on to topical questions. And I call John Dallant. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, I am very much aware that this is the last time uh, John O'Dowd will be answering questions as Minister for Education, and he's not seeking renomination to that particular post. So, maybe following on from the last question, could I ask him how great does it concern him that young adults in Northern Ireland are in the bottom half of the league tables for literacy and numeracy, as compiled by the Organisation for Economic Cooperation and Development, which reflects educational standards across the world, from the richest to the poorest? Uh, it concerns me greatly, uh, and the member will be aware that over, uh, particularly this last five years of office, we have seen the educational attainment, attainment levels for our young people uh, grow dramatically, particularly those who are from the most socially disadvantaged backgrounds. And indeed, last year we see a 6% growth in educational attainment uh, in, our, in our education system. So we are beginning to see change. We are beginning to see the fruits of policies being implemented, being delivered, being pursued. And all those policies aren't always popular. Uh, the member will remain, remember only too well uh, the common funding formula saga. And every question time I came into this chamber, I was challenged from every other party on the floor of this chamber over diverting funds from schools to those schools most in need. Uh, I think that decision, based against what was a, a very uh, negative approach by some in the political sphere, a genuine concern by some within the education sphere uh, and others, I think was the right decision to be made and will continue to pay benefits in years to come. I call John Dallet for supplement. Well, maybe just following on from the, the theme that Mr O'Dowd is leaving us, could I ask what advice would he give to his successor to ensure that in the future our young people, particularly from socially disadvantaged backgrounds, have a fair chance of a good job which is well paid or aspire to further education. And I say that, Mr Deputy Speaker, and the full knowledge that this Assembly is now in its 18th year, and people who were only born have now left school the, the without literacy and numeracy skills. Minister. Yes, and, and the member will also therefore acknowledge that there is a change. That, the outcomes for our young people are improving year on year, and we are beginning to pay the benefits of a local assembly, of a local administration, of a local minister, of a local minister being held to account by the committee, by the assembly, by the executive. Uh, the advice I would give any incoming minister would be this. I think we have a suite of policies in place which can and will continue to play, pay benefits for our young people. I would encourage them to work with their executive colleagues in relation to ensuring that the Department of Education continues to uh, benefit from investment from the executive over and above other departments. And I acknowledge that other departments are taking a greater hit than education other than health uh, to ensure that investment is taking place in education. Uh, and I would ask them to continue to work against what is the major fault line in our education system, academic selection. I call John McAllister. Uh, thank you, Deputy Speaker. Um, can the Minister inform the House the number and percentage of empty school places that currently exist in Northern Ireland? Uh, I, I don't have uh, the up-to-date information in front of me, but the, uh, the member will be aware that during my time as Minister I have been working through the area planning process to deal with uh, what has been described in numerous reports down through this last decade as an unsustainable schools estate out there and that we have to restructure our schools estate to ensure that we have sustainable schools moving forward that can provide the education which Mr Dallas and, and others in the chamber uh, so desperately want for our young people. I call John McAllister. And thank you, Deputy Speaker. I'm grateful to the Minister for <clears throat> his reply, but he, he must surely acknowledge that uh, well, he hasn't the figure with him. It's way short of the 10% recommended uh, in being many years ago. And he will also, in the light of that, and this is going to be his last question time as Education Minister. So, in the light of that, what will he do to, lead, to make sure that 
is shared education bill with the purpose of using efficient and effective use of resources to make the education authority use that shared education uh, bill to drive a less fragmented um, planning process and use it as a tool to make sure we have efficient and effective use of resources? Um, well, through area planning uh, is the most effective and efficient way of, of delivering change across our schools to state. We now have every sector sitting around the one table planning the schools to state moving forward. And it hasn't been perfect. It hasn't been easy uh, rolling forward. But we are taking uh, on mindsets. We're changing mindsets. There is vested interest in every aspect of our society. Education is no different. But I do see a willingness and a, and a change of attitude from five years ago when I stood in this chamber. <coughs> Excuse me, Deputy Speaker. When I stood in this chamber in September 2011 and read out uh, my statement, putting pupils first, and at the very heart of that statement was a proposal for an area planning driven process moving forward. There was deep concern across the chamber, there was deep concern across the education sector about that. But now we have buy in that there needs to be change, there needs to be re a realignment of our, of our schools' estate, and there needs to be greater sharing uh, to achieve that. So I'm optimistic about area planning going into the future. Uh, I believe we have the right recipe. We just have to make sure that it moves forward properly. Moving on, I call George Robinson. <clears throat> uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Would the Minister state what funding in this departmental budget he has applied for to ensure new school builds throughout Northern Ireland? <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, our, our capital budget for this year has actually increased on last year, uh, and I'm actually quite pleased with uh, the outcomes uh, of our capital budget. Um, uh, la last year, our capital budget was 147 million. Uh, this year, uh, we're starting off uh, with, with a much increase. I think it's around 180 million pounds. I'll confirm that figure with the member. Uh, in writing, but we have quite a significantly increased capital budget, which really means we can move forward and catch up on the backlog of minor works. We can move forward with the school enhancement programmes that have been delayed. We can announce a further build for the primary school sector, uh, and we can make real significant changes to our schools of state. I call George Robinson for supplementary. Thank the Minister for his reply. And, uh, could I ask the Minister, could he ensure that existing schools in the East London area constituency will be given the funding? The new build were required, such as Melbourne Primary and uh, Cologne Primary? Well, uh, the, the, the member quite rightly refers to schools within his uh, constituency, and, and in fairness, he, he regularly lobbies and campaigns for uh, schools within his constituency. We will continue moving thro forward through uh, the building backlog which we have, and uh, I am conscious that if I do make a statement around new builds uh, before the end of this mandate. I'd please a few and disappoint many. But I, I'm, I think we have to continue to chipping away to ensure that we, we continue the building programme. And every time we introduce a new batch of new builds, it means the list gets shorter and that more schools move forward with the opportunity of getting a new build into the future. So I think, and, uh, uh, as I said earlier, I would encourage the next Education Minister to work closely uh, with his executive colleagues around the budget. And in that budget, I would include capital, because not only is it improving the schools of state, it's making a significant impact in the economy through the construction industry. I call Adrian McQuillan. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Uh, Minister, you told us early, uh, an earlier answer that there are 5,000 children available of the Irish medium uh, education system now at the minute. Could you tell us how many pupils actually attend the Irish medium school in Dungiven? Um, approximately, I, I think there's around 17 pupils attending the Irish medium uh, school in Dungiven. Uh, but the member will be aware it is the only post-primary Irish medium school in that entire area. The only other, the, the only other facility is in College of First Year in uh, Belfast. So I think it's only right and proper that we facilitate Irish medium education in that area. There is a significant number of these school nurseries, bond schools in that area, primary schools, which will uh, allow for Gale School Euro to grow into the future and to become uh, a school which all members, hopefully, in the Chamber will pay a wee bit more respect to. It sounds to me as if it hasn't got very much support in the area. There's only 17 people going to it at the minute. But could you break that down then as well to tell us that how much per pupil it's costing to have that school in and given compared to, to the school, say, in Limavady? 
I, I don't have the figures in front of me, but I'm more than happy to supply the member the figures. And perhaps we should supply the figures how much it would cost to bus the children to College of Forestry in Belfast, uh, or how much it would cost the children to, to travel other distances to continue to be taught through the medium of Irish. Uh, th these children, and there's many in this chamber who tell me they support parental preference, parental choice. These people's parents want to be taught through the medium of Irish. Why is that seen as such a threat to yourself and others? Why, why, why do members such as yourself... Order. No, it's not value for money. It's a convenient argument, value for money. Why do members such as yourselves get so prickly about these matters? Why did you go and visit the school and put some of those questions to the, the, the Board of Governors, to the principal, to the teachers, to the pupils? And you know what? You'll find that these people don't have horns in their head, that they come from all different walks of life, that they have all different opinions in life, but they, they have one thing in common. They want to be taught through the medium of Irish. I am proud to say that I facilitated them. I am proud of that fact. And when we look at the growth of post-primary provision in the Belfast area in relation to uh, Irish medium, the numbers there started in single figures. We now have a, a school of over 600, which is one of the highest performing schools in terms of GCSEs. So the educational quality is quite good. So members shouldn't get so prickly about these matters. It's young people being taught through the medium of Irish, uh, and the Department of Education is rightly facilitating that, and I'm proud to facilitate it. Yeah. I call Nelson McCausland. Uh, thank you indeed. Um, could I ask the Minister in regard to special education? One of the issues that is often brought to my attention by parents of children uh, who uh, attend special schools is the fact that there is an imbalance in the distribution of the schools in the Greater Belfast area, with particular deficit in the North Belfast area. And um, Would he give me his thoughts on what he intends to do uh, in the next few weeks while he's still there um, to uh, address that issue and what he has been doing to address it. Uh, the, the member will be aware that we did carry out a, an area planning review of special educational needs provision, uh, including in the Belfast area. That report is now with the EA, and the EA are working through that report. They're also looking at uh, some of the, the learning centres we have in our schools, etc., to, to, to match up services being provided across. Uh, the North. So there is active ongoing work in regards to that matter to ensure that we have a network of special educational needs schools which are accessible to parents and pupils and to ensure that it's sustainable going into the future. Um, would the Minister agree with me that um, whilst parents and others in rural areas may look at distances and think that if something is happening in Belfast, uh, it's very easy to get from one part of the city to another quickly. But that if you happen to live in North Belfast, it's probably as quick to get to Balamina as it would be to get to, from North Belfast to a school in South Belfast. And has that issue of traffic density, uh, particularly at the rush hour in the morning when children are going to school and so on, been taken into account? I, I do take on board the member's comments, and, and some of my own colleagues from Belfast constantly remind me of, of the travel times, regardless of distance, the travel times across Belfast in the mornings or the afternoons when, when school times are running. Though that, that accessibility has been taken into account, and that has to take into account travel times, whether it's in Belfast or elsewhere. I call Gordon Dunn. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. How can the Minister justify the fact that in Ards and North Down area there has been no new schools built since 2011, whilst there has been 56 in the rest of Northern Ireland, including four in Lurgan, which happens to be in the Upper Ban constituency? Uh, the schools in the Upper Ban constituency, I can tell the member, have been waiting for decades on new builds. Uh, Yes, but they've been waiting on decades for new builds. I just happen to be in the right place at the right time in regards to that matter. Uh, why, why has there been no... Why, the member asked the question in relation to... I, I assume he's referring to, in relation, particularly in relation to Hollywood. The member knows the equation which we're trying to solve in Hollywood. It, it's, it's a domino effect of trying to get one school moved off, to get another school moved on to a site, etc., etc., etc. I can assure the member I have been trying to work that domino, through, uh, that domino effect through in terms of the budget that we have. And I refer the member to the previous question uh, asked by Mr. Agnew earlier in regards to that matter. I think there may be light at the end of the tunnel. And that is the time up for questions to the Minister of Education.